So this is a very, very exciting time for, well, one for me, but I think just broadly, I think very exciting to be a part of this conference. And it is especially exciting for me because I started my career in sales computation and how I grew was learning from experts like the ones that we have on today's panel, but also throughout the week. And, and I would say that it was a massive accelerator for my career. And I started my career not ever thinking that I would get to a point where I could sit in a room with both Rick and Dr. Robert Bich Rick Butler and Dr. Robert Bichar and have an amazing discussion on a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. So uh, I'm very, very excited to officially kick off uh, Comp Ops 2023. And with that, uh, I would love to uh, pass it over to, to Rick uh, and then uh, Robert to introduce themselves. So. Thanks, Nabil. My name is Rick Butler. I'm currently Vice President of Global Sales Compensation at ServiceNow. I've been doing sales compensation professionally since 2001. Uh, I ran the programs at Lucent, Dell, EMC, Cisco, and now ServiceNow. Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, as Nabil mentioned, my name is Robert Bishar. Uh, work for Autodesk, Senior Director for Worldwide Sales Incentive Compensation and Acquisitions, i.e. we all have a few hobbies. Um, for once, I can say I haven't been doing it, have not been doing it quite as long as Rick. I actually um, am four years shorter than he is, but doing this for quite some time as well. Um, both at companies such as Microsoft, as well as helping our partners and internally at Autodesk. Amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you again, both for, for joining today. And, and uh, as I mentioned, and Christina shared that this conference is about experts giving back and sharing with other sales comp professionals um, and, and truly building a community around what is a very engaging and, and, uh, uh, you know, from a career perspective and, and very uh, enlightening career, but also one that's not easy and, and one that, that comes with all the, the thanklessness and, and, and difficulties associated with it. But one thing I wanted, wanted to kick off today, you know, before we dive into the future of sales comp and, and, and how we think about it from the perspective of, you know, the next 10 or the next five to 10 years is maybe just to do a retrospective based off your experience and actually take a look at what has changed and what are the major things that you've seen come about in the world of sales comp over the last, uh, over, over your careers and uh, in, in, over the last specifically 10 to 20 years. And so, um, yeah, maybe I'll pass it to you, uh, Rick, to, to kick us off. Okay. So uh, I'd say there's probably two things that stand out in my mind that have changed over the, the 22 years that I've been doing this. Uh, first, and probably the most obvious one, is uh, when I started, there were really only two choices for how to run a sales compensation program, right? One was Excel. Um, of course, that's a long time ago. It survived and still is used today. And then the other choice was usually some type of data center-based application at your company, which when I was starting out, it was an Oracle-based platform. Now, of course, um, flash forward 20 plus years, and now the number of choices that are available out there uh, obviously have multiplied significantly, but more importantly, so has the way you access the tools. Now, of course, the bulk of them being cloud-based tools. So that's one significant change. But I think the, the one that really is more pertinent for, for us on the phone is the complexity of what is sold and how it is sold has changed dramatically over over the last 22 years. Uh, when I started, the concept of having so many different products and SKUs to choose from that you needed to be able to track and trace back to a seller and tie their quota and results to it, far different than what we have today. We've evolved to a scenario today where, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of different products, identifications or SKUs that you could choose from that would sell and a customer could consume and making sure that you've got everything wired to accommodate that now is where the bulk of the time is actually spent. Curious, Robert, how, how, how different or similar is your answer? Um, building on what Rick said. So I think it's a fundamental shift that over the past 20 years, we've seen a significant increase in complexity of business models, pricing, what you need to keep track of and how. And so while in the past, 
incentive comp management was pretty much just, you know, how do I pay somebody accurately? Um, you know, it started, as Rick said, with Excel, and then we got solutions. The requirements from the business, and when I say business, it's usually your chief revenue officer who's um, providing the demands and the requirements, saying, I need to track more, I need to be able to drive a sales strategy more, I need to be able to drive certain go-to-market approaches differently than we have in the past, that creates a far more complicated environment that, quote unquote, the old school method just could not, and they still exist today, cannot cover. So the level of flexibility that the systems require today is orders of magnitude different from where we started 20 years ago. And I'll say it's even an order or a few orders of magnitude more complicated than just four or five years ago. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is, this is oh, sorry, go ahead, Rick. I was going to say that's a great point, Robert. Um, you know, the delivery vehicles for you and I with software tools, especially in the way now customers consume those, um, very different than when it was just buy a perpetual license and the sale was done and you move on. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think as, as productivity increases everywhere, as, as tools and I want to say the specialization of roles increases within sales, you're starting to see more and more complexity just by the nature of I think a single sales transaction 20, 30 years ago might have touched three or four people within an organization. And now you could have upwards of 20 different stakeholders touching different parts of the sales motion. And how do you create incentive structures that align everyone on that journey to create a great customer outcome, I think kind of leads into uh, or bleeds into the difficulty of, 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 of set, setting and executing on sales comp. You're basically nowadays, so what we've always said is sales incentive comp in itself is not a strategy. It basically supports and drives the strategy, the corporate strategy, the sales strategy, the go-to-market strategy. But if your sales comp plan doesn't support it, it's not going to happen. So while sales comp is a strategy, it's not in itself a strategy. I know that sounds strange. But at the end of the day, it's your business model, your pricing, what you want to focus on, and how you actually want the sellers to behave overall is what your comp strategy is supposed to drive. And that has increased significantly in complexity compared to years ago, where the types of offerings are different. Um, you might have on-prem, cloud, um, you might have unlimited licensing, you might, and just keeps going from there. And all of a sudden you're trying to fix that into, well, what do I actually want the seller to focus on? And to the point in the past, you kind of just had a lagging indicator, i.e. you looked at the past and said, well, this is probably going to work. Now you're actually asked by your sales manager to look into the future and tell them what's going to happen. And that's probably the biggest shift overall in that sales comp is not just to look backwards and yes, we actually accomplished what we wanted, but are we going to accomplish what we want to? And that I think is the biggest revolution. It's not just an evolution, that's a revolution because it's literally a shift upside down from where we were before. In the past, I said, we just needed to pay people correctly and get the paychecks out on time. People were happy. Now we're actually defining how they're going to get their paychecks in a far better way and being able to emulate and simulate if that's going to happen or not. Yeah, in fact, uh, it's a great point, Robert, because you know it's it's moving from just having a lot of data to actually having the information that you're talking about, where you can help the sales leader either find out what's working and not working, point them to those places maybe they need to do a little extra inspection or coaching, uh, find who your truly good salespeople are rather than just those that are perhaps making the most much and, and extracting the most pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's and it's that connectivity of. It's not, you know, the data volumes increasing and kind of what I describe as an, ex an exponential or um, a multidimensional perspective because we have more market data. We have more activity data that's robust and, and, and effectively collected in a, in a uh, context aware manner. And then you have more data on, you know, the downstream and the consumption and the engagement from customers. We're not just tracking how much is sold, but also how our products are actually consumed and, and used by our customers. And if you're in the tech world, uh, but even outside of the tech, I mean, this is actually an interesting, I know that you're, you know, we're both talking here from 
or all three of us are really in the world of software, but even outside of software, everything from med products to distribution customers are having technology be baked into their products and services, and they're collecting more data than ever before. So it's very interesting, um, you know, this kind of exponential increase in, in data that we can use as a part of the sales comp process. Now, there was a point where um, I could get away with telling a sales leader or a finance leader uh, that the system can't support it or we can't do it because we don't have the data, right? Uh, nowadays, I still say it, but it's not as defensible because I know that we probably can do just about whatever they ask. Usually they start laughing at us when we say that the system doesn't support it. I mean, fundamentally to your point, in the old days, yes, sold a perpetual license. The maintenance you had to sell with it was pretty much a hamster wheel that sold itself. Um, now you're in a subscription, a SaaS world where your renewal is not guaranteed unless you're sticky. And so you have to create incentives. You have to create motions that actually support it overall. And to the point you mentioned, Nabil, the amount of data available today I mean, at the end of the day, it was probably to a degree available in the past. We just didn't know how to use it or didn't know how to decipher it. But the requirement today is decipher it and figuring it out so that there's a shift to not just having a sale itself, which, which what Rick and I started focused on in the past, but now it's a consumption. It is an adoption. It is a usage overall. So all of a sudden, it's not just a, a sell, but it's the continuous life cycle of the customer that is being pulled into variable compensation that in the past was not the case. In the past, it was just sales, and then we're done, and we pay, and we move on. Now it becomes more and more complicated as additional steps within the lifespan or the life circle of a customer um, are being pulled into variable comp, and people want to drive a certain behavior that goes beyond or in parallel to the actual sale itself. And so on that topic of, you know, we're kind of at this inflection point of change uh, over the last, you know, two, three years. I, I'm curious now looking much further forward, you know, the next five to 10 years, where do you see, you know, when I, when I say the word sales comp 2.0, where do you see this future of, of, of sales comp going? You know, for me, <laughs> go ahead, Robert. No, you go ahead, please. I, I was going to say for me, uh, it could probably be summed up in one or two words, right? Um, and it plays back on a comment Robert made a few moments ago. Um, the predictive analytics that help us be smarter in terms of, of both, you know, how we set quotas, how we define territories, how we deploy and, and manage resources, I think is is kind of key for us, right? That's Going to be a big play and then i think the other one has to do with uh, personalization you know how we um you know customize today everything for everybody right your browser comes up and recommends those uh particular ads that make sense to you uh, or how amazon recommends what the next thing to buy is right i think in the world of, of sales compensation you know our sellers are looking for a more personalized experience too, whether it's personalized in terms of how the data from the compensation tool presents to them, right? To perhaps the types of rewards that you put in place and mechanisms you put in place, you know, that they can receive upon, again, either demonstrating the proper behaviors or generating the results that you want. Yeah. Going in a similar fashion, um, predictive analytics slash AI, will play a far more significant role than it does did yesterday, where it was just predictive analytics. Now the learning and prediction and being able to say, okay, if I model this plan, what is it going to do? What is it going to do for the business? Um, today might just be for a simple plan. In the future, you'll actually be able to simulate that for all the roles involved in a sales motion overall from start to finish to be able to predict what is going to happen? Is it going to be successful? Are these plans going to work? Do I need to tweak some parameters of certain comp plans within there? I.e. the individualization by role will become far more important. And then for visibility for the individual seller being able to more customize what they see to help them actually get more motivated to continue selling what to 
focus on. And that drives everything from your pipeline to at the end of the day, doing accruals and amortization for your finances. Yeah. In fact, you know, we use a, a roles based design process for our plans to date, right? So it's uh, fairly, I'll say straightforward, right? An account executive plan or a systems or solution consultant plan or a product specialist plan, right? But I'm starting to also see a desire to not only have the plan unique to the role, but the role customized to who they're selling to at the client's organization. If I'm selling to the CIO or someone in the IT organization, the approach behaviors, even the salesperson, very different than maybe someone that's selling into the, the business side of the, the house, whether it's someone you're selling to in HR or in finance or in sales. Yeah. 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 I mean, in addition to that, I see more and more emphasis and focus being um, put on segmentation, customer segmentation. Mm -hmm. So classic old school, you know, you have enterprise, SMB, VSB, that's it. Now we're starting to see sub-segmentation within there where you then have specialized roles focused on a subset. To Rick's point, you now have more, even though the role may carry the same title, and maybe one day we'll change that or we'll put a numeric number or something behind it so we can differentiate it. The comp plan for somebody covering a certain type of enterprise customer versus a high potential growth enterprise customer is different. Um, what they do is different. Their day-to-day -day business is different. What they're supposed to be doing, the strategy behind it is different. So therefore you have to come up with different motions, which in itself then defines a different comp plan for that respective role. And I think the one size fits all, as we tried to do it in the past, is slowly, slowly changing to where we actually have to focus on more detail. And in the past, that would have been highly complicated because implementing comp plans and some of the systems we've had in the past, start with Excel, is very limited by our intellectual capacity and what we can put into it. Um, nowadays, we have more options. It is more flexible. Um, the guardrails are far further away than they ever have been in the past. I mean, I, I wanted to, I want to double click on on the concept of personalization because uh, Robert, you and I have had these conversations a lot, and and I think it's kind of useful to have have this as a in a, in a group discussion and kind of for the sake of sharing with the audience because it's a nuance that that changed my perspective um, on how I thought about it. So two things: one is when we say personalization, I mean this is kind of actually what led me to want to found Forma is that looking at how incentives are rolled out in in the in the consumer market through loyalty programs thinking looking at how you know again to, to Rick's point on like whether it's websites advertising to uh, the the you know the consumption of a news feed is tailored to my behavior my activity my my perception of it but there is something nuanced here around you know personalization or individualization at the individual level versus at the selling motion level and um, I think it's an important clarification. And I'm, you know, Robert, I'm curious, you know, if you want to kick us off on on, on your perspective of that, because I think it is, you know, it, it changed my perspective a little bit on on that when we when we had the discussion. Yeah, the one thing where I always say, careful what you ask for, because it beca could become a monster, is when we use the word individualization. I, for myself, automatically say, oh, it's individual for me as a person. But the problem with that is. If you have individual plans by seller, i.e. by individual person, it easily gets way out of control. Um, to put it in perspective, we have over 2,000 salespeople. If we had 2,000 sales comp plans, it would be a nightmare to administrate overall or to actually understand how to enable the people. And so what I do believe is there's an individualization by role and the roles is, is where it essentially starts for us to figure out what do they actually need to do. So the role covers certain motions, which is tied to certain segments, which then has a certain comp plan that will drive the respective behavior. You don't necessarily, my subjective opinion, have to go underneath it and say, well, each individual is going to behave differently. If you have that defined, you've got a very clear picture of where it's supposed to go. Now, having said that, on the flip side, 
what I consume as an individual seller, yeah. that I would like to probably personalize because um, I want to see if I'm going to President's Club. Rick might want to see if he's making enough money. You might want to see something completely different again, where it is against your pipeline. So I think those things are more personalizable, just like your website, just like your homepage that you have, or when you log into Google or Bing or whatever your um, choice is. But at the core of the plan, that, in my opinion, should stay with the role. Now, we're going to have, probably have more roles than we have in the past because in the past, we weren't able to go as granular as we can today. And that was going to be my follow-up question. Oh, sorry, uh, Rick. I, I was just going to, to say, because Robert uh, triggered a thought in my head, you know, about <laughs> the individualization versus personalization, right? Um, you know, the way the tool presents um, its information to you as a seller, that's, I think, where the individualization, what's important, right? Um, but the, the the sales motion itself, I think, is also interesting uh, when we look at it in terms of, you know, who the customer is, who's being targeted and what their expectations are. Right. Uh, each seller brings to the table, obviously, their own nuanced approach to, to dealing with the customers. Right. And you want to reward that. You want to make sure that happens, that they have the flexibility to do that. But also in Robert's point within some guardrails, right? It can't be completely unconstrained because having to roll that information up or generate reports from it when it's all over the map doesn't give you enough fodder to be able to go in and actually see any trends or any details. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's interesting because the there's something that you said in our previous discussion um, where with individualization, the risk is enablement, right? It becomes very difficult to actually enable sellers. And part of my mind, you know, I, I go to the kind of technology solution of like, okay, well, is there a way to solve this technology and enable the the, the seller, you know, using different, you know, different ways to kind of educate them or, and help them understand what their plans are. And, you know, after our discussion, what became clear to me is it's not just about technology enabling. It's you need the sales, the sales reps management and leadership to understand what's driving that seller. And if you start creating individualized plans, you kind of lose that human understanding of, of what's actually happening. But yeah. doing it at a role level, being able to truly in personalize and individualize the plans mm -hmm. without compromise at an individual role level, basically I'm saying these are the drivers, these are the behaviors we want within this selling function. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it is an approach where it's very clear every seller in this role is being motivated and driven in this specific way and this is how we're tracking them the consumption of course is should be tailored to how people consume just like my news feed is very different than your news feed on any sort of you know social media platform or uh or, or search etc and so you know that's a very interesting piece um the one thing i would say is you know just kind of stepping back and now we define it as personalization at a role level where does that stop because you know as the as the future of you know, if I think about if roles start to become very, very personalized, whatever that is, personalized to the customer experience, what's going to stop the organization from, you know, hiring specific types of people who have access to certain types of networks or have, you know, certain experience and creating and tailoring roles into that. And so does, does it end up leading to complete individualization anyways? But, you know, more of a thought experiment here. Where does where does that stop, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now? I'll, I'll start if you don't mind. So companies have been hiring based on a certain profile you wanted to have. So say, for example, an enterprise customer or an enterprise salesperson. They've always been doing that. The thing is, it was more a broader stroke than a more granular sort of take a pencil and sharply circle what you're actually looking for. And I think we're now at a state, contrary to the past, where you can either do it by customer persona or by customer type, where the person you're looking to hire and the comp plan that will go with it at the end of the day is far more defined than in the past, where it's just, I want an enterprise seller. I want an SMB seller. I want somebody who focuses on VSB. So, um, it's more towards a segment of it. Do you have large enterprise customers talking over, say, over 100 million in revenue, 
um, and keep going from there. What do you actually need to focus on? What are the sales motions? Who are the contact people? What are the types of contract? Okay, now I know exactly what motions I need and what role I need and how to compensate that person. So what you're doing at the same time is you're narrowing your available pool of resources out there in the market that you could hire for that role, of course. But I think that's the direction it is going. There will be a greater specialization due to the fact that we can actually compensate based on that as opposed to in the past where we just couldn't. Yeah, I've had a recent experience like that, uh, Robert, where uh, the person selected came to the table with exactly the right combination of skills and background experience to be able to satisfy a specific customer need, right? And, and perhaps it's unique, but it's a good example. Um, selling into the federal government and specifically into uh, some of the defense agencies, right? Uh, the knowledge of how business is conducted, the knowledge of you know what the uh, appropriate regulations are in terms of even being able to bid, let alone actually secure a, a proposal. Uh, all of those things requires a, a special kind of seller. We, we do uh, look for certain people, right, for their skills and background and experiences because you know that the customer demands it. Uh, but it's interesting, too, uh, as far back as when I started, uh, one of the other conversations that always came up is we wanted to, to be able to sell solutions, right? And back in the day, people were just selling products. Well, you know, flash forward here 20 years, people still sell products, but it's how you bring the products together to formulate the solution that meets or solves a customer issue. That's really, I think, where the, the true salespeople really shine. Yeah. 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 And to your point, Rick, in the past, we said we sold solutions. No, we just sold features within products and sold that as a solution. Um, now the drive is more and more going towards platform where you can integrate components into it. And so now you're going to make that work as part of your comp plan as well. So you just added another dimension of complexity into it. Yeah. So I want to take a slight, you know, We'll come back to this in terms of the challenges this is going to face in getting there. But I want to, I want to touch on something else that you, you mentioned, Robert, which is the application of AI and how we, you know, where, where that future lies. And so I guess two things. One is um, it would be great to roll out a, uh, a poll just to the broader audience of, you know, what does everyone, uh, like, where does everyone, or sorry, let me, let me step back. Is anyone actually regularly using AI in their sales conference? I think that'll be a great poll just to kind of get a sense from the broader group. But just diving into um, the sales comp, you know, sales comp, the world of sales comp and how AI is going to be applied. I'm curious to get your perspective, both Robert and Rick, like how you see that changing the way that we operate. So I can go first on this one. Um, ServiceNow in its own platform became AI enabled uh, several months ago. And the way we're putting our platform into action for our salespeople is through the creation of something we call sales assist. So it's actually a way in kind of the large language models that a salesperson could go in and, and ask a question about, you know, how to sell X, Y, or Z, or even how to sell to customer A, B, or C, right? And it gives them some additional insights that they then can factor into their sales process uh, in terms of either who to talk to, what to say, how to say it, or what to position. So again, early days for us, uh, but that's one of the ways that we're using it starting to. I think overall, I love the poll. It says no and not yet, but plan to. I would summarize all of those as not yet. I think everybody in I won't even say mid to distant future, but in the near future is going to start using AI in one way or another. Um, we will all have to. With the increased complexity, we're never going to be able to um, do the things we need to do, both for motion planning, both for customer segmentation, both for um, defining how to sell to customer and figure out, okay, wh what is my best approach for this type of customer? So I give a set of features into it and say, okay, tell me what, what I need to do so I'm successful in selling to this customer. And on that same token, how do we actually pay people for doing that? Because it becomes more and more complicated to figure out 
what's going to motivate people to sell? Um, sure, we can use the old school statement. Um, salespeople are coin operated and they love the limelight. Well, that's not going to change, but you need to figure out where to put the coin into so it actually operates the way you want it to. And so I think there's going to be more and more use of AI in the sales execution itself, as well as on our side in trying to figure out, okay, how do we drive the right sales execution with comp? And then let alone all the back office things that we do okay on today, be it what's your commission forecast? Um, things like that. It sounds trivial, but you know, our CFOs hold us accountable for the money we spend. And so being able to predict it correctly upfront is always very helpful. And with the more and more complicated we build our comp plans, the more and more complicated it becomes to actually estimate it and the more reliability you have to have in quota setting and everything else that goes with it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I uh, couldn't agree more. I mean, even little things like the back office forecast for the commission. I mean, if you can be 0.1% accurate, that means you could unlock how much extra revenue, like commission budget that we keep as buffer and deploy that incentive money elsewhere to drive different behaviors. I mean, there's all kinds of benefits. And I think there's another point that you touched on, like, where McKinsey did a study a while back, and it, I, I, if I recall correctly, it's 2.6 times the ROI is produced from organizations that are leaders in leveraging innovation than the laggards. And I think this is, again, it's not, it's not a, a, a crazy or controversial statement to make. I think that's kind of, you see this in, in the world, but um, I want to, I, you know, I know we didn't discuss this before, so I'm going to throw out this crazy concept. And it's something I was fortunate enough to be at this conference uh, over the weekend with, uh, some leaders, thought leaders in the AI world, um, and you know, just kind of hearing from them what the future is going to look like in the next two to three years, and how that the real implications are going to have on sales comp. And so, the the common consensus is that we are going to live in a world where we are not, we don't have sentient AI. What we have is we have specialized models or agents that are going to be very good at doing specific tasks. And we're, we're not too far from a world where every one of us is going to have a swarm of agents that are going to be personalized and working to execute on our task work. And so now I want you to picture this vision of a future where a seller might have 20, 30 different agents that are executing on different task work to collect information about customers, to compile emails, to compile decks, materials, et cetera, et cetera. And now these agents need to work together in some sort of optimization and incentivized structure to produce an outcome. And so imagine a world where we're not just incentivizing the seller. We now need to give best practices and guidance to the seller to incentivize the different AI agents to work together to produce an outcome. And so how do how, like in, in that world, which is so radically different than how we operate today, I'm curious how you think that will impact the way that we even think about incentive structures and, and that multi-layer structure that I'm talking about. You get the first shot at this one, Robert. <laughs> I was hoping you would take it first. Um, I think it comes back to what we just said. And I don't think it's, it's a big, it's not going to be a single step jump. It's going to be a gradual evolution to being able to determine the different agency you were just referring to the different approaches, the different coverage. I think, we, we're seeing the big shift now going from ICM to SPM or incentive comp management to sales performance management. Then within sales performance management, we're going to see the same evolution. We slowly started seeing in ICM where we hit the wall and then SPM came around. We're going to see the same evolution in SPM. Now, I don't think we're going to hit the same wall in the next five to 10 years, but at some point it will come as well. And then what's next after that? That I cannot answer at the moment. Yeah. And so far, the people who know me, my next comment will probably make sense. Um, I, I tend to look at things uh, from a lot of different angles. And to your question, I'm going to come at it from a different perspective, right? So if I'm the salesperson that has the 20 bots supporting me to be a more effective or efficient seller, 
the customer is also going to have 20 bots helping them to be a better customer and discerner of truth and also a definer of value, right? And so, you know, to borrow a phrase, I'll have my bot call your bot and we'll get together after they've connected, right? <laughs> but you can visualize a scenario where uh, just in terms of efficiency and productivity, right? If you can get through all the noise, right? I think that's where the real benefit's going to rely. It's not going to eliminate the person or the salesperson or the customer from the operation of, of conducting business, right? But it changes what they do, right? Uh, the things that you might have had to spend a lot of time on in the past, right? Whether it's a value proposition or whatever, those things start to go by the, the side because the bots are doing it, right? They're having that type of give and take, if you will, right? But it's really going to, I think, put more emphasis on the relationship the reputation of the salesperson of the company, that's, I think, really where the key is going to move to. Yeah. To that point, it's going to be far more personalized by a customer than ever before. In the past, you basically had to puzzle it together. Um, I think this is where the bots and your AI is going to significantly help you in the future, creating not only what the customer wants to consume, but also figuring out before the customer asks you what the system thinks they will want to consume. I think that's the fundamental shift that will happen in the near future. Yeah, yeah. And you said this, you, know, you both mentioned this earlier on the importance of segmentation and, and, and defining that. And I think we're gonna have to get to a world where we understand our customers way better in order to truly optimize the incentive structures that we put in front of the, the sellers and ultimately the roles that we allocate and then the incentives we put in front of the seller. Mm -hmm. um, that goes in multiple directions. That goes in what's the type of company, what are the pain points the company are facing, and what are the pain points and things the individual in the company, be it the CTO, the CIO, the CFO, the CEO, or the CRO are facing that you have to address. Yep. And I said, then it all comes back to comp. How do you make people actually focus on it? Yeah. And so, um, on the AI node, maybe just another uh, poll to put out to the audience. Uh, in the world of sales comp, where does everyone think AI would be the most useful? Design, administration, or optimization? Can I say all of the above? That is, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I believe you, I'm not sure if in the poll we can actually have that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it looks like optimization so far has, has, the, has the lead in terms of number of votes. But yeah, I, I think uh, I would tend to agree. Like you can't, talking about the brick walls that you were mentioning earlier, Robert, the moment you significantly surpass one, you're going to start hitting built, like, you know, you're going to hit that brick wall and the ability to execute or administer it. Uh, the ability to actually design the incentives in a certain way. So I guess, um, yeah. And having would, AI for one, for example, designing your comp plans and being able to use AI to predict if it's going to be a positive or negative outcome and what the plan is going to do, what's the behavior pattern you're going to see. Well, once you start with that, all the things on the sideline all of a sudden become far more important that were noise before and now you, you actually want to optimize for those things as well. So that's your next step is like, okay, I can't solve that on my own. Here's your next opportunity for AI. Yeah. So I, I can't see the, the counts or votes for all of the categories, but I'm getting yeah. the sense that optimization might have been the biggest. And, and perhaps it's by virtue of where I'm at in my process now or where I see it having the biggest play for us. Um, I would go down the path of administration actually first, uh, simply because um, today we spend a lot of time answering the seller's queries about what's going on and what we've seen, at least with our statistics, about 70 or 80% of them are questions that can be answered from other sources our terms and conditions or our plan documents or things like that, right? Or pointing them to the right tools that are already are at their disposal that maybe they haven't either learned about yet or they've forgotten, right? So I think administration for me is probably where it has the biggest play. And then I think it's a close second then with optimization. Yeah. Yeah. And, and here's where I'll sort of tie them all together with a nice bow. If you're doing the administration, 
and you have to optimize with AI, it basically shows you didn't do a good job on the design or the optimization explaining how it works. So this is, this is why I said all of the above. If you improve on administration, you're automatically going to impact the optimization. And as such, going back from there, it's actually walking backwards. You're going to improve on the design as well. And so they're not independent of one another. They're actually intertwined fairly closely. Yeah. And then the other thing just to note is like the importance of data, right? Mm -hmm. AI is not just this magic tool that you can throw out. I mean, it's quite interesting how, how much volume of data was required before these large language models actually produced a meaningfully impact, like positive impact. And I think one of the things that we miss out on is that we don't have enough structured data and applying, you know, kind of the AI to, to administration is a very positive, you know, powerful way of collecting data in a very context driven way where you can then use that data to further optimize, to further, you know, support and design um, and so forth. Yeah, in so, fact, to that yeah. point on the AI front, you know, I mentioned sales assist, which is what we're using now with our sellers. We're experimenting with it right now for our administration assist to answer those questions. What we've learned in the short term is you have to be very careful what, if you will, references or sources you point the AI to to make sure that the answers are the right answers. Um, You'd be surprised when we started to test uh, with our questions and, and, and the types of things that we said, some of the answers we'd get back and it was because it was using this obscure document that was in some random location that we hadn't tied off, right? And so uh, again, you know, it, it's not a panacea. It's gonna require its own attention and work to make sure that it's doing things that you want it to do rather than what it thinks it should do. Yeah, right. 100%. I mean, I think this is where we're kind of in this very interesting in, in inflection point of uh, this shift is going to require a lot of human oversight. And uh, it's not, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's a tool, it's a prediction model. And you have to think about how do you, where do you put your human in the loop to make sure that you don't get kind of like runaway uh, negative impacts to the organization, you know, again, accidentally pull, pulling to one data source and, um, yeah, there was a, a TV show, it's uh, 60 Minutes, which is a U.S.-based uh, news program every week that did a story on AI several months ago. And I'm not one to write into the TV or to the, the shows, but I wrote in on this one. And I, I've said, I think this might be the most important story you've ever told for that very point, Neil. Yeah. No, I mean, the, the this revolution that's coming and happening, whether we like it or not, is uh, <laughs> one that I think and I believe you know, wholeheartedly that will basically trump the and and overtake the inflection point that we had with the personal computer, the one that we had with the mobile phone. And and I think it's happening very quickly and far faster than than what everyone believes. And so yeah, it's like how do you how do you start leveraging and and, and jumping in? And so maybe stepping back and kind of to 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 you know tie us out, what do we what do you both think are the biggest challenges that are gonna hinder us from adopting and innovating in the next five to 10 years from the world of sales comp? I think if I start, um, actually, it's funny that Rick just mentioned the 60 minutes because I thought that was a really good contribution as well. And it helped people understand it. I think one of the big issues with AI is the fear of it and the hesitancy that a lot of people have in using it because it's like, oh my God, it's going to take over the world. Um, the robots will rule us is like, take a step back and think about what it really is. Yes, it is self-learning. Will it replace human beings in the sales cycle in certain portions of it? Yes, I have no doubt, but in other portions, it will open up the ability for more humans to interact. So just like with the industrial revolution saw a fundamental shift, this will also show a fundamental shift on where and how people focus, but it'll still require people. And yes, you have to have a certain level of responsibility not to misuse AI. I think that's something we all have to look at. Um, but overall, I think it's the elimination of the fear of it and that it's going to take something away from you and bringing it back into, there's actually an advantage to using it and it's an advantage for everybody not just for you know a corporation that's trying to save money no that 
is not necessarily the case because they may actually spend more money. 100% is funny. I, I had someone bring up this point last week to me and said, you know, like with AI, what's what's my job? And, you know, where, what, what, where is my role? And the point I always take is in the history of human civilization, increased productivity has always led to more work. And the simple answer is because humans are never satisfied. We accomplish something, we get something, and we want more, and we want more. And increased productivity just creates a further desire for more. And I think um, you know the whole premise of this conversation, imagine being 20 years ago, kicking off your career in sales comp and hearing, okay, we want individ individualized you know, role-based comp plans. Like, no, it's one size fits all. That's all our ERP can handle. That's all of our, our database systems can handle. And so like, it's just enabling us to do more with 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 the same amount of resources that we had. Um, that's a very well point. Now, to your point, there will be roles that go away yeah. um, and there will be roles that get created just like at any point in time when, I mean, think about it this way, um, car manufacturing, um, think of the Model T, the welding was done by hand. That's done by robots now. Now the people focus on something fundamentally different when building the car. Doesn't mean there's a lot less people it just means it shifts to something else. And the same thing is happening with AI with respect to comp, where we're now able to do more granular, more detailed things that we weren't able to do before, to your point, one size fits all, that allows us to individualize based on market, based on geo, for example, based on role, which would have been far too complicated. And with AI, you're now able to optimize each one of them or in the past, you just have to live with the fact that your limitation was what Excel could do and what you could come up with your own personal intellectual capacity as to what you could put into Excel. And that boundary has been removed. Yeah, I, I to, to quote Spider-Man, um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, right? And AI is the great power, right? Which means, you know, we're going to need very, responsible salespeople to use it in the proper way, right? And as administrators of programs, as designers of programs, the same thing is true, right? Yet we'll be able to be smarter, we'll be able to be more efficient, more effective. Uh, it's not going to free up a whole lot of time. It's going to redirect where you're spending your time, right? And hopefully it'll have you spend time on higher order value types of things rather than on things that maybe took a lot of time. Uh, when I look at Again, my career and, and where I spent time and, and whatnot, um, you know, the, the day of the overhead projector and the blank transparency with markers was the way you delivered a presentation. The caliber of presentations were 35 millimeter because it was a 35 millimeter slide. Now we spend our time creating PowerPoints on our laptops. And I guarantee you, we probably spend more time now making sure that the slide looks exactly right than we did when we were writing it on the blank transparency or when we had someone else creating the slide. So it's about how you really shift your focus, you know, and as it relates specifically to plan design, it's the same thing, right? When you're now needing to focus on a sales motion, right? Or a particular segment of the market or a specific type of customer, I find myself giving much more time and energy and thought to what do I want the outcome to be as opposed to just making sure it's about paying the person for the result, you know? What's the motion and the outcome you want to drive? And that's what you need to build your plan around. And that's the part that now becomes more possible than in the past. Yeah. So just to shift into Q and A here before we wrap up, I think yep. there's you know some, some points that you brought that are very relevant. And maybe I'll, I'll kick it off here with an answer. I'm curious to get your perspective, Rick and, and Robert. So uh, one of the questions here, uh, I'm just going by the, the the votes. So please, you know, like and engage with, with different questions um, so we can, and, and feel free to ask. Um, so the practical use cases for generative AI and sales comp. And I think I want to step back and, and kind of think about this as a twofold. Again, you need structured data. Without structured data, you know, a, like these tools the, and 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 these large language models, these, these, these AI uh, resources do not support or help. So if you have well-structured data, when you think about the kind of the, the longer term vision is instead of coming up with a plan based off of an idea that we have and then testing it, imagine if you could have a agent that kicks off a thousand different iterations of possible plans, financially models them and comes to us 
with a representation of here are the top three from an ROI perspective based off of the, the modeling calculation that was done. Yeah. And I think that's where it changes the, the role because no longer are, you know, as, as humans, we're in the position of making decisions, analyzing the outputs, and then, and then you know, setting a, charting a path forward rather than having to kind of guess by picking a needle in the haystack. Right. Now, one challenge today in AI, we need structured data. Yes. Now, if you're asking five to 10 years, I'm, I'm, I'm going to place a bet, quote unquote, <laughs> that it will start being able to digest unstructured data to recognize patterns and actually build the suggestions off of something that is would blow our minds today and we would never be able to do it. So I think today, agreed. The first shift is we're able to digest a multitude more of data sources than we were ever in the past, but they have to be to at least to a degree structured. In the future, that will expand to unstructured all over the place data. And then, then you'll truly, what is the best plan to be able to do this? And that's where I believe the journey is going. It won't eliminate the need for um, incentive comp designers, operations people, implementation people. They'll always remain because somebody has to actually think about that as well. But the level of variations you can bring in is going to increase more and more and more, which today is slowly getting there. We're just on the brink of it. My view on the generative uh, AI use case uh, probably goes back to, again, thinking about how we set quotas, how we divide territories, and running the scenarios where you want to look at several different combinations or permutations. And instead of several, it could be hundreds or thousands of permutations, right? And so it's it's truly about that third bullet that we had on the previous poll, the optimization aspect of it, right? Um, you know, the concept of, you know, structured versus unstructured data. I mean, back in the day, all data was unstructured until we actually forced it to have a structure, right? Uh, and I always tell my team, you know, I said, I want to shift you from, you know, doing 80 to 90% of your preparing the data and only 10% analyzing it. I want to shift that so that you're doing 80 to 90% of the analyzation. You don't have to worry about the preparation. So that's where I'm hoping that we see a big impact. Agreed. Yeah. Shift I mean, to more value add as opposed to just being somebody who spends time trying to structure something, now turn it around and do a value added discussion. Yeah. So this leads into um, a question that, that's uh, that's come in on uh, how this technology changed your team's responsibility, Robert. And then which roles have changed, which ones have gone away, which ones have been created in your mind? Um, okay. I think where it starts most important and immediate is for the commission analysts, i.e. those people that actually process uh, the paychecks for people. That team is now not just focused on being able to provide the right pay amounts, but actually being able to have more valuable conversations with both the finance side of the house, as well as with the sales management side of the house on what they're looking at, why they're looking at it, why they're seeing the results they're seeing and being able to predict or not just predict, but actually make recommendations where to tweak and make changes so that it becomes more successful over the time. And I think that is a fundamental shift that in the past, just wasn't possible to Rick's point before if you spend 80 to 90% of your time trying to get the data right. And then 10% trying to uh, figure out what you're actually looking at. Now you can turn it around. You can spend 80 to 90% thinking about what you're looking at. That gives you an opportunity to provide optimizations and support for those respective uh, teams. That wasn't possible before. Yeah. Yeah, and I do think, I mean, this is, goes back to, you know, the world of sales comp, the, the role itself is a difficult one. You know, you need to be technical, analytical, and you need to be an amazing stakeholder, like a manager of, of many different stakeholders. And to, you know, to have to be technical and those two other, 
like key skill sets is very difficult. It's like kind of a it's a it's a unicorn type of profile <laughs> versus optimizing for the things that are truly adding a ton of value to the business, which is the management of stakeholders and the being analytical and strategic. So if you you get rid of the technical requirement, the technical uh, uh, you know bottleneck, then you can just unlock uh, unlock a ton more. But um, uh, you know, as as we wrap, I don't I don't see anything. Um, uh, I know there's other questions, and I'm just trying to be conscious of time here, so so we can wrap up on time. Is there anything that we didn't cover today, uh, Rick or Robert, that that you want to share with the with the audience um, as kind of parting words? So I'll go first, I guess. Um, you know, I think all of us who are in this role, uh, either as the, the leader of the sales comp group or even as, as the member of a comp group, um, you know, the, the thing that's interesting about the job is uh, it's a job where people come up to you and they say they don't want your job because it's so complex, right? And, you know, it, it takes uh, a special combination of those three things, in the deal that you mentioned to be able to conduct the job properly and to satisfy the, the, the organization you're supporting, which at the end of the day, our customers are the sales leaders and the sales people, right? Um, you know, I would like to say that, you know, as I think about doing this job in the future, right? You know, it's being uh, more fair, more empathetic, but also making sure that uh, the reward mechanisms are commensurate with the results being generated, right? And, and doing that in a way that uh, people feel good about the outcome. Uh, you can't satisfy everybody in the process, nor should you try to. But on the other hand, you know, you want it to be the best plan that you can for the company, the best plan for the generation and rewarding of results. Yeah. Um, taking a slightly different angle, I think this is an extremely exciting time to be in sales incentive comp or in variable comp altogether. And the reason I say variable comp is because we're adding things that were never possible before. If you think about, you know, <clears throat> when the first person was confronted with being able to do incentive comp, not just in a book, but actually in Excel, that was a big evolution or revolution. Then going to ICM systems that were able to do it in a more reliable fashion, that was a big evolution. Going to where we are today, and the next steps that are coming is a gigantic revolution. And this is a great time to be in this role. Um, the things we can do now in comparison to just a few years ago, it's amazing where it's developing to. And so if you're new to it, you came to the right place. This is a fun, fun field. And to Rick's point, yes, there are enough people who say, I love your job, but I would never want to do it because I'd have to take accountability and responsibility for paying all these people correctly. Um, that's true. That's part of what we do. Um, the empathy part is not unimportant there, but at the same time, look at where we can take this. This is, this is just the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. I think um, it's one of the largest levers most organizations have is their comp spend and how they motivate and drive their sellers. Um, I just can't say thank you enough for 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 joining Rick and, and Robert and, and and you know sharing all your amazing thoughts and I uh, again this is very surreal to me to have have had the opportunity to kind of moderate and be a part of this discussion with both of you and um, I want to thank everyone that's uh, you know, that's that's joined us today on 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 this panel and uh, very excited to kick off the rest of the week full of great panelists and great discussions. Um, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Robert. Thank you, Rick. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate the time.